Here we go. Okay. All right, well, happy Saturday. It's July 10th, 2021. And uh, we welcome you to Paint Branch Unitarian Universalist's Church Adult Faith Development Program. If you're here for Birding for Life, you are in the right place. Today we have Reverend Laura Kim Joyner, um, Dr. Reverend Laura Kim Joyner with us today. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to having her. This is the second session of the second class of a of Birding for Life. And we also invite you to join us for Sunday services at 10 a.m. every Sunday. And you can find a link to our services on our Facebook page. We would love for you to join us. Um, all of our services are virtual right now. And may we just light our chalice to remember that our connection to nature and other species is still sacred and still good for ourselves and for the earth. All right, now, uh, Reverend Laura Kim, you can take it from here. Lovely, lovely, lovely. I'll go ahead and share the screen. And can we hear me okay? All righty. Um, thank you so much for, for having me here. And there aren't many of us on, so please feel chatty if you'd like, use the chat. And of course, uh, interrupt me as well because I can't see the chat so well right now. And I'm with the uh, Unitarian Universalist Congregation in White Plains, New York. And this is part two, but it really does its own thing. So it's okay if you didn't come to to the first one. And I, I would like to begin with opening words, a meditation as you will, because we're, we're here on Zoom, we're not out with the real birds. So let's pretend we're out with the birds and we're gonna to listen to a little bit of music. And this these are starlings and they're in doing a flock phenomenon known as murmuration and it's set to Paco Bell's music. And I'm gonna go, further into it and let's just relax into this and have this be our bird moment and it might last for a couple minutes all righty okay here we go
Wow. Well, what, what did the birds do when they're doing that? It looks like they were like dancing with each other. Um, and sometimes they get so packed and I didn't see any, any of them falling from the sky, sky from knocking into each other. Like, how do they do that? You know, okay. why? What is that? That's amazing. Yeah, I, people are still trying to figure out why. And, and a number of different species do that, but starlings are really known for doing mm. it. And it's, it's often done with, in the evening when they're coming in to roost for the night and they sleep in large numbers as protection and sociability perhaps. And, and so they're coming in and then why do they do quite that dance before they decide which trees to land in? A lot of birds do that. They, they flit and they play from, from tree to tree before they settle in. I don't know if they're being sociable, they're looking for mates, they're trying to evade predators with all that movement and they're not quite sure which tree to land in. And so they're using group flock wisdom to tell themselves, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Okay, we're gonna land here and, mm -hmm. and it's safe here, but maybe they're just playing and dancing and having a good time as well. Wow. <laughs> and if you, if you go on YouTube and search for that, you can see lots of different people who have filmed and it's just amazing the what, what the birds do uh, so that's our that's our getting into our moment of, of watching birds and this is a check-in and we may not want to do that with so few of us but it's open and in the chat and if nobody wants to share out loud we'll just take a moment to pause to, for people to say who's here and if you want to answer a question and participate is when have you been surprised by birds or in awe, such as that video? And when have you maybe had a relationship with a bird? And I asked those two questions because that's what we're gonna talk about today. So um, I'll, I'll start. So I'm Lord Kim Joyner. When have I been surprised by birds? Well, all the time. <laughs> uh, I have seen a starling murmuration a couple times when I've been driving much smaller numbers, not nearly as incredible as that one is, but it's always just a joy to see big groups of birds moving. And I think one of the times is when waterfowl over the winter are coming through and you all are in the area where there's a lot of waterfowl, they can come in by the millions and you're just looking at the sky going, oh my gosh, how can there be that many birds? So that's my check-in. Joe, would you like to say a few words? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I'm Joe from Annandale, Virginia, and I'm just trying to get very much into with birds, you know, from the knowledge base. Um, so this is great for me to be listening to to the uh, reverend here. And my connection with birds uh, has to do a lot with. Um, the visits that they make to my little native sanctuary backyard, a little tiny corner that I just set for nature. And so now I have hummingbirds coming in. I have the golden finch, you know, eating the seeds of my flowers and, you know, sitting, memorizing and seeing them come in and, you know, the colors, the moves, uh, the connections, you know, how do they, communicate with each other and how do they fight over little turtles and these kind of things. It is so amazingly touching and magnificent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jill. Um, I remember being surprised by reading an article about penguins and penguins are birds, you know, penguins are birds and about how um, these two male penguins who were in a relationship with each other. Um, they didn't have an egg and somehow the, the handlers saw that there was an egg that the parents had abandoned or the parent had died. And so they took that egg and put it in the little nest of these two male penguins and they were so happy and they raised that little baby. <laughs> and, um, oh, and so yeah. I didn't know, I think it's the first time I even knew that animals, you know, had you know, weren't always hetero, however. Um, and uh, uh, 
relationship with birds. Um, I remember like a little baby bird had fallen from the nest and trying to, you know, make it better. And then we put it back and then the mom kicked it back out again, you know, and then I think, um, you know, if it smells different or something, you know, you're not supposed to touch the bird and just remembering how, um, the circle of life and just how delicate those things are um, and how sometimes uh, you have to reach out to experts and not try to do things yourself. You know, birds are more complex than we think they are. Oh, I can just put them back in the nest or whatever. Like you got to have an expert because they're complex and there's things that you may not know. Um, and I mean, I had a cousin who had birds and they would sing um, and um Sometimes they would fly around and come back. Uh, they just seemed to, you know, they brought her a lot of joy and they seemed to be happy. Um, but I always wondered, particularly with birds, you know, you know, some birds who, who, who fly, you know, is it really good to have them in the house in a cage? You know, it didn't seem right to me. And I remember thinking that, um, and I have cats and they're indoor outdoor because I just can't imagine holding hostage an animal. You know, my cats come back because they want to, you know, I, I open the door. The door is open for them right now. The little sliding door. I open it in the morning. They can come in and out as they like. So um, I just think about that. Yeah, there's you, you bring up the idea of how we're in relationship with birds. And we're going to talk about that when maybe we we're not even talking to them or around them. But we we see them in our feeder and we our cousin has them and. And, and we're thinking about it. And, and so that's that's being in, in relationship. And if you want towards the end, we could talk about what to do more with, mm. with baby birds that fall. And uh, we can talk about birds in captivity. You know, I could, mm. I, could, I could say an awful lot about both of those, but why don't mm. we just hold that? And okay. if we like, and you're interested, we can come back to it. So this is just a teeny piece of a, a review from last week. Is, is why watch birds and humans, we are fed through the possibility of transformation of changing our lives. And it's also physical and mental health to connect to, to nature and wildlife and birds. And it can help us do better care. I, I say here a more a biotic, a more just biotic community, but that just basically means more compassionate care, how to take care of those baby birds that fall out of the nest, how to make them, uh, a moral decision, whether we we can put wild animals into cages for our own company and desire. So all these things is what 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 we're going to talk about today. And just just a little last piece of review is birds help us increase our connection and care. That's that's sort of why I'm interested in giving this this presentation by growing our and there's these five different kinds of intelligences that and there's more than this, but we're born with these and we can grow them all. And so last week we did multi-species intelligence, which is just really asking what do birds need and feel? And, and that's what we really concentrated on last week is understanding a bird and a bird's life. And this week we're going to do ec ecological and spiritual intelligence. Um, and I'm not going to say much about emotional and social intelligence, but one thing. And here we go. So emotional, social, and multi-species intelligence is really just asking the question and learning to get better at asking the question and listening, what am I and others needing and feeling across the species lines? And the more of these intelligences that we have, the more we can care for ourselves and others and the earth and our organizations. Uh, and we can all be healthier if we grow these and we can all grow them. Some are born with more than others, but it's always something we can intentionally work on. And so in bird walks that we give, I, I live in the New York area, we'll, we'll do a bird walk and, and we, we take time, sort of like what you were doing, Ebony, we were taking time to connect and, and say, what do you feel and need when you see those birds? And what does a baby bird need? And so we're, we're connecting and building community and we're listening to one another. 
we're not just identifying, oh, that's a red start and it's a juvenile and it's second year's plumage. We're not just doing that. We're, we're building community and we're listening to each other. And we're doing this because we want to be healthy and we want a just human community too. And so, so we're paying attention to the various oppressions and harm that come to both people and the earth and wildlife and birds from the same oppressions. And I'm not gonna talk any more about justice than this, but I just wanna say that birds are a window in to take care of ourselves and other people. And of course the birds and life on this planet. And if you wanna know more about this, I'll give you some resources at the end. It's Reverend Laura Kim Joyner. I just wanna welcome Carmelita to the class. Hi Carmelita, good morning. Probably has to work to get herself off of mute. <laughs> Good morning. Great. Thank you for being here. Just want to say hello. Okay. Oh, that's great. That's great. Good to good to see you. And uh, chat away at, at any time and ask any questions, please, uh, all of you all. So ecological intelligence, what is that? Well, here's a long definition of what that is. And it's it's really just asking what does everybody in the ecological system or community feel and what do they need? And, and so it's looking at the relationships between all the different species. And we're really looking at what is the relationship between humans and others, because sometimes we're not so aware of all the benefits and harm that are happening because of our presence. And so we're paying attention to this so we can minimize harm and maximize flourishing for all, and ours included. So we're, we're paying attention to stuff that's going on. And so we're gonna talk about ecology, but we're gonna concentrate on birds as a way to grow our intelligence of the relationships that are all around us. And a few more thoughts about ecological intelligence. Ecology's a, a tough world out there. The world's tough. Yeah, Ebony, you mentioned it about baby birds in the cycle of life and, and hard things happen to young birds and adult birds and to us. And so ecology is looking at that and going, oh my gosh, there's inherent harm and tragedy in the cycle of life, not to mention in human culture, but there's benefit and beauty as well. And so we, we want to look at all of this, even though it's uncomfortable and it may go against the way we were taught, um, but we do this so we can increase our choice on what to do with this understanding of reality. You know, maybe, I don't know about you all, but when, when I go outside for a walk in the springtime, I go, oh my gosh, there's a baby bird on the sidewalk. I'm going to have to do something now. Or there's an injured bird that just got hit by a car. Oh, I'm going to have to do something now. And, and I'm a wildlife veterinarian, so I, I know a little bit about what to do. Uh, but it's it's a responsibility the more you know and the more you look. And so it's not an easy, I'm not saying this is easy or anything that you should have to do to look at all that is a bird's life. And my, the invitation that I feel, and maybe you do too, is if that we can find a way to embrace this reality of, of seeing what really is, we may feel embraced in return. Like we belong and we matter because we're, we're in direct, honest relationship with life around us. And so here's a chance if anybody wants to share uh, or write in the chat, or let's just take a moment of silence and, and think about what is hard for you to embrace? You know, this is a chance for us to check in with emotional and social intelligence. And I just threw a couple of things out there that, that may, be something that's hard for you to accept. Or maybe we just want to talk about wildlife and, and the earth. And that is um, blessings and sacreds to, to the people who are de depicted here. It was a burial site in South America and male and female, and they were buried together as if they were embracing. So I, I use that, that kind of maybe challenging picture to show about how we can embrace that, which is hard and scary. Um, so I don't know, does anybody feel like they, they want to share here or give some examples about what may be hard for you and others you know to, to embrace? Uh, this is Joe, uh, Reverend, and I think that 
I think that in general, as part of the human nature, we are not equipped in our culture, different from other cultures, to embrace you know all the elements that you are talking about. You know the cycle of life. If you know you look on the native and the original peoples' cultures, they are so in tune with nature that you know in some places they celebrate you know, the passing of a person because they have an understanding of going to a different dimension or whatever, you know, the philosophical construct that they have. In our case, you know, that sense of embracing reality and life as it is and seeing that suffering is help us grow. And, you know, we are stronger after suffering. We don't, we don't live that in general. We are not taught about these kind of things. And so when there is any loss, when there is any death, you know, we, are, we go desperate and crazy and our suffering, it is devastated. And it is, you know, I, I, for, it's sad to see some people who, um, from the um, position of the fear, and the agony of suffering, sometimes they like to hug having people on this side of the of the life, regardless of how much they are suffering and whatnot. Yes, like I see, like a parent, and you see parents suffering tremendously, and the possibility of allow this person to go. We just hold, hold, hold because you know the the fear of oh my gosh, my pain and my agony. So I think that if we were to learn, and I love what you are saying on the cycle of life, you were to learn that this is a dynamic, we are not look for it, we don't purposely intend you know, to, to bring it to us, but this big understanding that, you know, we come here and it's part of a cycle and, you know, it is, you know, the circle, you have you start in one point and, you know, to complete it, we have to get to the other point and it is beginning and end on one dimension. So that's what I have to say. And thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> lovely, lovely. I don't have anything to add. Mm -mm. No. Um, I'll just add one little piece is going, I, I, I struggle with all of those, you know, I, I can push away reality at all kinds of levels. And that's the work, that's, that's my work in the world. So being in, in, in healthy and honest relationship with all that is can come about knowing ourselves and our world. And, and so the more we know ourselves in the world, the more we can have an honest and, and, and caring relationship with ourselves and with other people and with other species. And so, the birds by seeking to understand birds and our relationships with them and using them as a tool to grab our attention because birds can really grab people's attention. You know, they, I heard something about a marketing tool. If you want to sell something, just slap a picture of a bird on it because, because you know, they often grab people's attention. So we can use birds as, as a means to grow to understand ourselves and others. And the, the vision and, and using birds as a spiritual practice and mindful practice is to help us accept what is reality. And part of that is accepting what is a bird's life. You know, what, what's going on with the birds and what's going on with everyone else? This is a, a picture of a, a family I know in La Mosquitia, Honduras. I work with this village together. We're, we're trying to work on an improving livelihoods and saving their endangered parrots. And so they take care of parrots and release them. And some come back and wanna be fed. And, and so you can see some hard things in there. Birds are being stolen, they're endangered. You can see the dog there is, doesn't, is very thin, doesn't have a high quality of life. And, and I, the, the people, I will, I will make no judgments or pieces about that, but some would say that they have a low, um, a low ability to use resources to improve their health and their choices and their education. So, wow, there's a lot going on there. And what is hurting the parrots is hurting the same pieces of oppression and economy is hurting everybody in that picture. So birds, if we're paying attention to birds, it can point the way to suffering and, and tragedy. 
yikes. So the vision is, is, is how to maybe not be at peace with that, but to go, that's, that's part of life and we accept it so we can change it, right? You know, it's sort of the this, this spiritual paradox. So what, what I want to lift up is this quote that came from a movie, The Thin Red Line. It's about World War II and the hero is fighting in the South Pacific and they just bombed, there was bombing on a hillside and it bombed a nest, a tree that had a nest of parrots and the baby birds fall out of the nest and they've been hit by, by the bombs and, and they're dying. And the hero of the movie looks at this bird and says, one man looks at a dying bird and thinks there's nothing but unanswered pain, that death's got the final answer, the final word that it's laughing at him. And another person sees that same bird, feels the glory, feels something smiling through it. And, and this is often what is the mindfulness practice, spiritual practice for, for many of us in our various traditions is, is, is how do we connect to all that is, even when it includes death and loss and suffering? Because if we can attune to that and be present to that, maybe we can be more attuned to belonging, love, compassion, and care and justice. So we're going to look at all that a bird is for the, the rest of this presentation. And I'm just sort of being funny here, but okay. So what's a bird? Well, you know, birds poop, right? That's, that's what they do. Well, let me tell you a little bit about bird feces. So here's a little more scientific piece of a, of a feces. And I was leading a bird wall bird walk once in urban Nashville, Tennessee, and we were at a spiritual retreat center and pigeons had perched along a gutter. And so there was a lot of pigeon feces spread out on the sidewalk. And so I got up to the sidewalk and I started explaining to the people on the bird walk what's going on with feces. And what I said was, well, here's a bird dropping and the, 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 the colored part is, is, you know, like what we would have with number two, our feces. And the white part is called urates because what birds do, they take the water out of their urine and it concentrates as a white paste. And they do have a little bit of urine, but basically they, they just do this white paste and, the, and it all comes out of the same opening. You know, the, they go, uh, they have feces and go number two, where they go number one, where eggs go out and where sperms come up and they don't have bladders. So they can't be storing this liquid. They have to be, you know, pulling out the liquid at the end of their protein metabolism. And why don't they have bladders? Because they, they need to fly. They can't be flying around with bags of liquid. And that's why they have hollow bones and they have air sacs all throughout their body to make them lighter. And so I was explaining all of this with, and looking at all this bunch of, of pigeon feces. And, and one woman looked at me and she was serious. She said, I don't know how anyone can doubt there is a God after they've looked at bird droppings. She was in awe of the bird droppings and how birds are put together. And her gate, gateway into that moment of awe was pigeon droppings on a city street. So go out there and look at bird droppings. <laughs> Not maybe as pretty as the birds themselves, but you'd be surprised at what you could find. Now that looks a little bit like a bird dropping, doesn't it? That's a moth that fakes looking like birds dropping so they won't get eaten and if you go on if you go on the internet you'll find a number of each it's insects but some there's a crab that does it as well and spiders that they fake looking like bird feces so they will not get eaten so go on out there explore the world and look for bird droppings another way that birds help us know about relationships this is a little more scientific and i'm going to use the word interdependent beneficence and what this means we're all connected in health that that one species can help a whole bunch of species and so when we go out and look at birds it's a way to see how all those relationships connect in health us included so this is a classic example of yellowstone and if and here are the the wolves and if you the wolves what they do is they hunt the, the, the elk and, and, and the deer in the area. 
And by hunting and eating and preying upon the elk, it keeps their numbers down so they don't overgraze. And if they overgraze, if you don't have wolves to eat the elk and they overgraze, the rivers are not as healthy and the plant diversity is much lower. So it can't support as many species. Uh, as, as many species. So, you know, here is, um, if we take out the wolves, the predators that are helping the whole environment, we have an environment that is, doesn't have wolves and it's got less animals and it's got less plants. And so that they all are depending on each other, even though the wolves are killing and that killing is part, is part of the health of the system. And so I want to just bring up another example of this interdependent healthiness. And I'm going to use parrots as an example, because that's who I work with. P uh, parrots, especially the large parrots, they, they fly around with seeds in their beaks. And, and so here we are. Here's a small macaw from South America. Can you see he's carrying this really big seed? And we've got some other macaws carrying seeds. And then here's a little parakeet, just a little parakeet eating a piece of fruit. So they also poop out the seeds. But what they do, that they're known as seed dispersers and they fly around. And without parrots, we don't have as a healthy as a forest because they're planting. They, they call them the farmers of the forest. And so we need parrots because they make the forest healthy. And if the forest is healthy, it helps all the rest of the wildlife. And then it helps the people that depend on the forest for clean water, for food, uh, for good soil, and for spiritual reasons too. And, and so this is you know, how we see all these connections because people you know, sometimes ask me, what does it matter that people are stealing all the parrots out of the forest for pets? Why do we need parrots? And it's like, we need wolves. You know, we need, need every piece of us in these relationships for it to be healthy. And then I want to talk about interdependent malfeasance. This is where harm is interconnected and related. And it's sort of the opposite. If you, if you take away the wolf, which is what humans do, then we're harming more than just the wolf. We're harming the whole habitat. So this is another way that we can use birds to help open our eyes about how complex harm and benefit are in the system. And this is just showing that a forest is that has been taken out. And so humans have to put up nest boxes because the birds have nowhere else to go. And this is actually true. You know, we, we take out lumber for uh, to build houses or to put in an agricultural field and, and we're hurting. So we don't have the birds, we don't have the parrots and then we don't have a healthy forest again. So there's this cascade of harm. And so I, I just wanna share some indigenous knowledge that was shared with me in the area of La Mosquitia Honduras here on the coast. It's the second largest remaining forest in Central America. And it's a place where they have these large seed dispersers. This is a scarlet macaw. And they nest mostly in pine trees. So can you see the eggs down there? And here are the chicks a couple weeks old. And here they are about nine weeks of age here, almost 10 and getting ready to fly. And this is a pine tree and this is uh, one of the mosquito men who knows how to climb trees. How does he know how to climb trees? Because they used to take the parrots and sell them and then they almost went extinct. And so the mosquito people said, well, you know, we'd like to come back from that. We'd like to have our parrots back. Would you work with us to do this? And I said, sure. And right before my first trip, Tomas, um, it was an indigenous leader for this area, suffered from the illegal nefarious elements that want to take these ancestral lands. So here's, here's what their villages look like. And people in the villages were having to flee because drug traffickers and people who wanted to take the land illegally were threatening the people. They were burning them out of their home. And Tomas was shot four times because he turned in the name of people who were trying to steal his land and the government didn't do anything, but the people whose names he turned into the government took revenge and waited for him down at the river one day and tried to kill him. He did survive. And five months later, he's down at the river telling me the story and showing me 
his scars where they took out the bullets and where there's still bullet fragments today. And I said, Tomas, and he was back with us. We had to hire a military platoon to go in with us. And I said, Tomas, why are you willing to risk your life for, for parrots? And he told me, Doctora, everything is at risk. So I am willing to risk everything. If the parrots don't make it, neither do my people. And, and so this is this idea of interdependent harm and, and benefit that we need all of us to, to make it, to get to the other side, to get to a, a flourishing in life. And because the health of one is the health of all. So in, in our conservation work, you know, we, we need to take care of the parakeets that are being illegally taken and the children and their food sources and the, the homes. And we don't take care of them. We, we work together and we all try to improve the health of all of us because we're all in, important. And so around, so this is, this is like off in Central America. You're going, well, what does this have to do with me? Well, I want to show you some more examples closer to home. And Ebony, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I did. Um, you talked about the person who knew how to, first of all, the story really touched me with the picture and everything to see just how deeply felt this is in these communities and that they actually reached out to you. You know, it wasn't just, oh, you know, Westerners coming in and we're trying to do something. The people in these communities care about their communities. And, and that resonates with me. Um, and then the part about when the person, you know, knew how to climb the trees because they were selling the birds. Um, I was wondering, are they selling them for pets or for food or, you know, and why those particular birds? Why were those particular birds, um, you know, so um, financially good for them to sell? Um, and, and I wonder, what are they doing instead? Like, how are they making up their money or are they just taking that hit, you know? Um, so I was curious about that. Of course, there's a, a really long answer to that, <laughs> but let's let's just do the abbreviated, the abbreviated version. Um, about in the 19, people have been taking parrots out of the wild for thousands of years in different cultures. It really started in the 14 and 1500s with colonization in the Americas. Uh, people want parrots as pets, oh my gosh. And it really took off in the United States in the 50s, 60s and 70s, and it was legal to do it then. So there was a huge market to buy parrots. So Tomas and his people, they, they didn't sell parrots or poach them, maybe sometimes for their own pets, but all of a sudden international buyers are coming to their village and saying, we'll, we'll pay you for these birds. And nine out of 10 of them will die on the way to Europe or the United States, but we're gonna make some money out of this. So his people learn to climb trees, it's dangerous. Um, people die from it. And they sold almost all their parrots because they were, they were sustenance farmers. So there's no cash, you know, there's, there's not cash, there's no jobs, they're way, way out there. Uh, but they could use some of the money from selling the parrots to, I don't know, buy medicines and, and uh, you know, clothes and school supplies. And so it was a real boon uh, for them to be able to sell the parrots. And then the world realized that we were, there are almost no parrots left in Honduras. So the government said it's, it's illegal now. The United States and Europe said it's illegal. Most countries say, we can't do this. We're losing the parrots and we need the parrots in the world. So it's illegal in Honduras to do this. And so what do they do instead? All kinds of things that people do. You know, the, they, they farm, they hunt, there's temporary jobs. But in this case, the village decided they no longer want to poach parrots because they want their parrots back. And those are the only kind of people we work with. We don't go in and tell people what to do. They have to decide. And, and it helps them make these decisions and it helps the quality of their life if they can partner with people who can pay stipends and train them to be conservationists. So a lot of their income is being made up by being hired as parrot rangers to, to, you know, to give them you know, quality of, of life and choices and take care of their children um, while they figure out if they wanna permanently try to stop the whole area of their neighbors from uh, illegally taking the parrots and losing all of their parrots forever. And it's unclear how it's going to go because not everybody in the village agrees, right? And then there are the criminal elements. So it's it's a mess. Uh, but the majority of the people want to stop 
and, and the hope is that they can develop income. We can, we're patrolling and then I'm gonna stop, but just so people understand, in this one project, it's 1.1 million acres of being patrolled to protect the last remaining scarlet macaws in Honduras. And for the amount of money it takes to run that and to give income to 11 communities, not everybody, but they spread it around, is about what it would cost to hire one park ranger in the United States a year. So it really has an impact on their quality of life and their choice in their economy for not much money. Um, uh, just being in solidarity with them to help out a little bit. So, okay, so closer to home, something that you may be more aware of is the use of DDT. And we know that DDT was really hard on, on animal life, but it really helped human health because we were killing the malaria, we were killing insects that were doing disease. And so we, we used a lot of DDT for human health and we also used it for our crops. And what they found out, as you know, is that the DDT causes all kinds of harm that ripples out, even though it's causing benefit for people. And some of the harm is it's really harmful for people acutely and then long term with with cancer and reproductive issues. And, and we found out this is in, in Borneo that you try to kill the mosquitoes that are killing malaria, which is you know, kills people. It's an awful disease, uh, but it kills wasps. It makes more caterpillars that eat that eat the homes and um, kill the cats and the mice went up and it accumulated the DDT in, in geckos and it killed the geckos and it killed the animals that were eating the geckos. And so, you know, we're spraying DDT trying to be helpful to humans and, 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 and what we need to do to eat and not have malaria, but it, was, it just was killing everybody else, including ourselves. And so in the United States, what happened is all this DDT accumulated and it killed insects and it killed the fish that ate them and it killed the birds that ate the fish. And so we almost did not have bald eagles. I don't know, some of you might be old enough to remember that when I was a child growing up, they were rare. And now we see them in many places all the time because we quit using DDT. We had to find another way to help humans, just like the people in Honduras are looking for another way to uh, uh, have, have good livelihoods and good choices in life, um, with, but without causing harm to everyone. And so that's why we need to know these relationships so we can make good choices on how to take care of all of us. So I just wanna uh, pause here and give us a chance to, to share is, uh, where have you seen positive and negative impacts on birds in terms of human activities? Where have you seen birds get helped or harmed that's also impacting humans or human activities or doing it? And so I've just got a couple ideas here. You know, the use of Roundup is like DDT, it's controversial, hurting insects and people. West Nile virus, if you wanna know more about that, we could talk about that, that we, um, we have increased mosquitoes and then this terrible disease got introduced and hit mammals and wiped out so many birds in the United States in around 1999. Um, large scale agriculture causes, ooh, it's so complicated. It helps us eat cheaper. It does in many places, but it's just killing the world. And then bird feeding it helps helps birds, right? And also is a source of harm for birds in, in many ways. So these are just some of the things that get you maybe thinking about if anyone wants to you know, ask any other questions or comment about where you see linking of harm and benefit between human and birds. And again, I don't have the chat up, so maybe you want to write in the chat. And maybe we don't have much to say here. I don't see anything in the chat right now. Um, but um, I've seen a lot of positive stuff around uh, people with bird feeders. And um, I know with my family, uh, we, my kids built a little bird feeder, hoping to, you know, because we have some really pretty little birds in our neighborhood. Um, but then the squirrels liked it a lot. And so we, we saw more squirrels than birds. <laughs> but, um, and then I have a friend of mine who um, 
sends me a little card in the mail, uh, m- maybe once a year saying something like, um, I think it's near the winter time. She says, you know, if you have scraps to throw away, you know, toss them outside because the birds could eat it or something like that. Um, uh, So I think people try, uh, but I don't think we're as cognizant about the chemicals though, you know. We're all learning, aren't we? And and I see there's the question about how does bird mm -hmm. harm, harm birds? It's so, it's so complex. The, the two of the most obvious ones that, that, that it's just much easier is that bird feeders are a source of infectious disease. And, and so you can clean your bird feeders, that helps, but they're all there sharing it. So there are a number of diseases that have been really hard on birds because they congregate at bird feeders. And there's one on the West Coast right now, it's a, a, it's a Form, it's a form of salmonella that's in California on the West Coast. And they just told everybody to take their bird feeders down because it's killing birds to do that. So that's um, one, one piece that, that goes on with it. And the other thing about bird feeders, uh, the hawks use bird feeders as feeding stations for themselves. So they know where the bird feeders are and they, they pull birds off of the bird feeders. And, and that's a piece of it. There And there's some sense they don't really get over dependent on the bird feeders maybe um but there's some sense that it takes resources to feed birds that seed comes from monoculture systems and it takes fuel to move the bird seed and so some people would suggest that the more ecological friendly thing to do is to plant bird friendly trees and bushes in your yard and don't be moving bird seed across the country and from one country to another, because that has an ecological impact. And there's so many benefits. I myself don't have bird feeders because of all these reasons. But my, when my sister came to live with me and she was dying, she really loved birds. So I put up bird feeders on every window and place around our house. So she was never without birds in her final months. It brought so, so much beauty to, to the household and to her life. And it helped us connect and talk about birds. So, you know, I, I, was, I just had to weigh benefits versus the harm. Beautiful. I, I like you, Reverend, um, stop having bear feeders. You know, at the beginning, it was, you know, the idea of, you know, how to attract them and have the uh, bear feeders. But as I you know, learn more and more listening, like, like knowledgeable people like yourself, then it is that the bear feeders for me are the plants. And looking and learning more and more about ensuring that we have plants available for all year cycle because there are different needs for different birds throughout the year and so what happens for the winter what happens for the migrating birds what happened for on um the uh early spring when they are hatching and so i've been expanding little by little the knowledge and it is my bird feeders are my plants and if i don't have sufficient plants then i'm not feeding my birds but i i stop I have the bird feeders because they look nice in the garden, but they, they are never filled, yes. And I love um, the dynamics with the squirrels. We were so beautiful seeing them navigating and you know, all of the contortionism, you know, gymnastics that they did to get to the, um, to the seeds. I lost that, but I just chose to get the plants to feed in the birds. And you know, it's a learning process, of course, but. Uh, little by little, making sure that, you know, we tr- try to recreate little domestically what we can do just to bring them home. So see how this conversation is a way of using birds to grow our understanding. This is, we just did the perfect example and it, and it's, it's not a, a, a judging thing at all. It's, it's just, what can we all learn and teach each other? And that's why I want to give you another practice around birds. It's, that, that helps us decrease judgment about different ways that people relate to birds and help us talk honestly about harm and benefit. It's something that's called ethno-ornithology, which means it studies the relationship between birds and people and also 
how you're interacting in that system between birds and people. And it's basically a journaling exercise. It's just writing down what you're seeing and what you're feeling and needing and how peoples are relating to birds. So it's not saying that the people who, who steal birds or are the people who have bird feeders, there's nothing wrong there. We, we all value birds or many of, of us do. We just value them for different reasons or for different motivations. So this is a field of studying cultures with as much as a, a objective, compassionate understanding and just writing down what we see. And so for Unitarian Universalists, this idea of journaling about nature is, it's actually, it's a mindful spiritual practice that we can claim as ours in Unitarian Universalism. It comes out of transcendentalism and it, it helps us be objective and also we're the subject because we're writing about our relationship with birds. And it, it is not ever saying that this is wrong. It's just saying, well, people eat birds, they hunt birds, they, they trap birds, they have them as pets, they love them, they conserve them. And, and so we're just studying it. And so it's a way to diminish judgment and increase empathy for, for one another in our differences. And one way that we can have a sense of moving beyond judgment for our own selves and for others is this idea of ecological empathy. Just by being out in nature, we have a sense of belonging. Our subconscious selves and bodies just know stuff. <laughs> we really do. And so getting out, and if you can't get out, look out your window. You know, just even if you can't walk, just sit outside and or have someone help you get outside. And 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 what happens is that your body knows that you're being seen and heard when you're out there. Yeah, you know, birds are paying attention to you. They're, they're, they're watching you, and so is everybody else. And you're watching them, even though you may not quite notice it. So by getting out looking at birds. Your, your body gets a sense that you always belong. Your cognitive loops that the culture has told you, you may not have worth and dignity and you may be wrong and blah, blah, blah. It is counter set by getting out and being in the natural world because it feels right. And, and we know we belong and we always have worth and dignity. And just so you know, birds are really watching you. Their, their facial expressions and their actions may not you may not know that because it's kind of hard to read a little sparrow's facial expressions from far away, but their studies are coming out now. And there was a, a famous one in Seattle where they had people wear a mask and they were working with, with crows. And they would like, if they wore a mask, they would yell at a crow or throw rocks. Well, that crow has, has a word, they, they have language. And so they have a word for dangerous human or human with rock or human with gun and they taught it to other crows who had never seen that mask and so the crows learned to stay away from people who looked like that they taught each other about the faces and jackdaws it's it's a kind of kind of like a blackbird crow thing in europe they do the same thing they're watching us and they've done studies with birds and hikers i don't know if you've you've gone out on a trail or a bird walk and and uh, or just a walk around the neighborhood and you go oh, there aren't many birds out and what are they doing they're watching you and they're moving away from you. Not all species, not all individuals, but there's a toll. When we go out, birds move away from us. We just may be not aware of it. So there's a co-watching that's going on. It isn't just you watching them, they're watching you. And so we're always in relationship with birds. We just forget that. And ecology is the studying of relationships. And we can grow this sense of belonging for us and the sense of belonging for them. So we take care of them. We're paying attention to them by getting out and paying attention to birds. And it's, it's, it's a way of developing a thou-thou relationship. You know, my, and my video's not gonna work right now. Uh, you can uh, Google this, but this is a, a species of bird that bows when other people, it's part of their territorial mating display, but it bows. When you bow, it bows. And, and so it's a way of humbling ourselves and, and bowing in recognition of the worth. There we go. Isn't that amazing? So this is the, how we can grow our sense of being in the presence of the holy other when we are watching birds, being open to everything that is. 
And just so you know, if you get outside to do birds, even if it's miserable weather, the benefits of being outside or going for a walk still help you, even though you may be fuming the whole time or it's too cold or you're miserable, you still get the health benefits. So look at that list of what happens when you go out walking. And, and if you can't walk, just sitting. And if you can't walk, look out the window. And if you can't look out a window, look at a video. You get decreasing return for all of these levels, but it still gives a a help. And so the more number of trees you have, the less crime rates you have in an area. You have more healing, uh, increased relationship health. So get out and birds help with get out, you know, because you, they're usually outside. And so we have to get out to do that. And another really neat thing about birds is we're often having to look up and looking up, you just, you're just not going to believe this. Looking up, they've done tests on this too causes greater kindness and compassion. It causes a shift in, in the integration of our neuronal pathway. So we have more integration and more sense of wholeness and empathy and belonging by looking up and also looking out over oceans and far distances. It's, it's similar, but looking up is really important. So that's another benefit of, of the birds. And they've done a study where in Europe, they figured out how diverse areas were with birds. And that means how many different kinds of species. And they found that life satisfaction of Europeans went up the more different kinds of birds they haven't had near their home. More birds makes you happier as much as money does is what this study showed. And there was a, another study, there's just an example of wildlife viewing, which includes birds, that it causes all these things to happen. And so now we're into a spiritual sense, aren't we? We're getting this idea of experiencing a state of flow, uh, increased physical health, yes, but a sense of belonging and mattering and a feeling of well-being <coughs> from looking at wildlife and birds are certainly a part of this. And so what we want to do is, is, is get out and feel a greater connection beyond ourselves and awe and wonderment and curiosity is all part of these these spiritual practices to, you know, to center us into, well, actually decenter humans, but center all of life as part of it. So this is, I just want to share this. This is in Guyana. I work near here, but not in this exact area. It's the tallest waterfall in the world. And so we went there to visit and out of the midst of this waterfall flew a pair of red and green macaws. They nest on the side of the waterfall. So that was a transcendent moment of awe and beauty that stayed with me and still is with me. And so birds can help us have these incredible moments and shifts. And they can also do it really slowly, just every day, thinking about birds or getting out there, it adds up just little, oh, look what that bird's doing. Oh my gosh, what's happening? And so we have just, I think this is our last sharing piece before we close up. Um, have you ever had a sense of just, uh, just you just being speechless when you've seen a bird do something or a number of birds? And you can put that in the chat. And uh, we're coming up towards our end time. Ebony, we wanted just an hour and 15 minutes or hour. You're on mute. Yes, I, I was talking to myself for a minute there. Um, I was saying, yes, it's a good time to begin to wind down. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. so, so maybe we'll just kind of hold that to the end and let me just okay. finish up with a couple of things then. Okay. Mm -hmm. So a uh, spiritual, well, wait a minute, let me stop. Do we just need to stop, stop? And I don't need to do this last piece. No, no, no. Go ahead and do this last piece. That's fine. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's all good. So spiritual intelligence, and I'm, I'm going to go a little quicker, it's the big view. It's about going beyond our ego concerns. It's about knowing that there's no separation between me and the rest of the life. And so the practice is to imagine that you are the whole watching the whole. And I just want to say that there are very spiritual traditions that encourage this. I think all of them do and of how to go beyond words. And so I'm, I'm just giving up one example of the Buddhist tradition where there, uh, this author writes about what happens to your brain when you look at birds. 
and it's very similar to Buddhist mindfulness practice. Hmm. And, and, and so I just want to point you in that direction. And I told him a story about what happened to me one time. I was out walking along the edge of the forest and the sun came up sort of like this in the fog and a group of parrots popped out chattering and really loud. And this was in Guatemala many years ago. And I fell to the ground sobbing when I saw them come out of the forest. I've seen parrots before. I was really embarrassed. I don't know what happened. Um, and, and he said, oh no, that's, that's, that's not unusual. Were you looking left or right? And I said, I was looking mostly right. He said, yes, it's more often white, white, looking to the right, that looking up and, and a sudden noise and movement can just click things and it can bring, he used the word enlightenment is the word that he would use. And I had a great sense that for months afterwards that love was one of the most important things to do and not my veterinary career or anything. So it shifted me and, mm -hmm. and, and it can happen suddenly, which we all want, right? Cause then we don't have to work for it <laughs> or you can do it slowly. And so because of this connection to everything, it helped, it can help grow our compassion and justice. And I, I think maybe I, I will tell this one last piece as closing words. This is that same mosquito village in Honduras and it was the beginning of the breeding season. So everybody went around saying prayers or opening words. And I did Mary Oliver instead uh, when it came my turn. And I had to adapt it because the poem wild geese, they don't, they don't have geese flying overhead in Guatemala. So the poem begins, um, you do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to love and let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair yours and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the wind and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the forest, the pine trees, the bean fields, the rivers, the jungles. Meanwhile, the macaws high in the clean blue air are heading home again. And just as we got to that part of the poem, we heard off in the distance five scarlet macaws, they're pretty loud, coming towards us. Mm. And five was rare at that time because they were losing their parrot. So I continued with the poem. And I said, no matter who you are, no matter how lonely you are, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you, harsh and exciting over and over again, announcing your place in the family of things. And so just when I said that, the birds were directly overhead. <laughs> And so there we were, people were crying. People were ecstatic because the birds were telling us that we belonged. And in that sense of belonging and awe and wonder, it helped very different people come together to work for the health and for the beauty of all, knowing that you know the birds need to be free and we all need to be free. And, and that's the work that we're going for. And so birds can help orient us towards this. I'm gonna skip this. So for actions, there's a lot of things you can do. Yeah, do eBird, go to our website. We have some freedom projects. We have the Unconditional Solidarity Project, all these ways. Um, you can get on and report birds you've seen here. That's justice issues, giving your science. Our website has resources. We have a book where you can read more about this. We have a whole program. And just in closing, I don't know if we'll have any time at all. I'll get it off the share. If people just want to give a closing word, a sharing of gratitude about anything as we leave the space with one another. I saw something in the chat. Carmelita says, will people ever choose birds over themselves? Mm -hmm. you want to say more about that? Or maybe you're just kind of musing, you know, what about humans? We're so hard on birds. Maybe we ought to consider their well being as much as ours, or at least more. And, and for me, it's, it's um, when I go out and I work with parrot conservation, I don't know who I care 
for more? Am I writing grants for the people or for the birds? You know, <laughs> you know yeah, I'm going, what, what? How do I write this grant? How do I do this? And the answer is, of course, both. Mm -hmm. Of course, both. Thank you. I've put um, the website to One Earth Conservation in the chat. Um, please donate to this nonprofit. Um, Reverend Dr. Lord Kim Joyner is on the board of this nonprofit, and it's what provides um, sustenance for her ministry, for, for helping those communities who want help and who ask for help in conserving their birds and in connecting um, with that love with everyone and every living being. So please donate there, oneearthconservation.org. One like O-N-E, uh, oneearthconservation.org. O-N-E, earthconservation.org. Please go there, learn more, and, uh, and donate. Please give that gift. And if you just want to chat or have any more questions or comments, you know, it's kind of hard. Oh, we're just going through this thing. Uh, I'm fairly open to conversation on email. So there's my email address as well. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so I, oh, so let me share my screen briefly. We extinguish this chalice to remember with our heart, mind, and spirit, the inherent worth and dignity of all life. May we bring justice and health to the earth. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this Adult Faith Development Program. And uh, we have two more coming up, Mysticism in Modern Times, which will be July 27th. And then we have Nurturing a Healthy Spirituality, uh, creating a path towards spiritual wholeness, which is in August. Well, thank you so much. And Reverend uh, Dr. Um, let's see, Reverend Lord Kim, thank you. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today and for giving us your wisdom on this topic. Um, it's a lot to think about, a lot to think about. Um, and we're not the only ones who are dealing with this issue. I mean, from Honduras to other countries to just what we can do in our own backyard, bird feeders. You know, there's nothing that we can't do, you know, to help birds, regardless of where we are in this planet, in this world. So a lot to think about and reflect on. Okay. I, mean, I, I like that, no matter where we are. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's one thing I get out of today, you know, like it, and it shows our interconnectedness too. You know, we're, we're dealing with how can we do better by birds and how can we get to know them better? Because birds are everywhere, you know, and so very interesting. Thank you. Well, have a great rest of the weekend, everyone. Take care and thank you. Bye-bye.